Sure. Exactly. I think most people have played a game of chess at some point. We all kind of know the rules. There's no luck involved because the game is really only settled by your decisions and problem solving skills. You take turns to move a piece at a time in order to trap your opponent's king. Let's make a run for it. Come back fools, protect me! But at the same time, I think most of us know that chess goes so much deeper than that too. It isn't just about understanding how the pieces move. Chess, of course, is a very complex game, and it's a game where you have to calculate a plethora of possible outcomes and moves. Well, at least if you want to be one of the best players. But most people don't. And that's okay, because chess can be pretty straightforward too. It can be enjoyed at all levels. We should really learn how to play the real way. <laughs> but it goes beyond entertainment too. Chess brings us together, socially. It's really easy to play with your friends, and at the same time it's a good way to meet new people, who may not even share the same language with you. So it kind of connects us across all of these divides, be it generational, socioeconomic, or even cultural divides. And it brings us together across geographies too, especially with the emergence of online chess. It helps us think too. Lots of studies talk about the mind health benefits and cognitive improvements to be gained from chess. And for some people, it actually helps them deal with issues like panic attacks or making life decisions. Let's dive into some of these claims to see how chess impacts our lives in different aspects, more than just entertaining us. But first, a little background, because how did chess even become such a big game that everyone knows in the first place? The history of chess stretches back centuries, oh come on John. What? Around 1500 years ago in India, an early version of chess known as Chaturanga slowly morphed into the game we know today. And this happened mostly through minor role changes here and there, especially as the game spread out into the world and circulated through new cultures. First, it went from India to gain ground in what was then Persia, and after that, to the Muslim world. By around the year 1500, chess made its way into southern Europe too, and that's where it kind of refined into the game we know today. Back then, chess was actually a pretty prestigious game to play, because it had a certain social value attached to it. It was a popular thing to do in high culture between nobility. One guy even listed chess as one of the seven skills that a good knight simply must acquire. The church, of course, viewed chess as a sin and equated it to gambling. But despite that, the game eventually became commonplace, even within the church, and soon clerics and upper echelon members began to play too. Also, around this time, we established chess theory, which is basically just how to play the game most optimally. Then, in the Enlightenment, chess became a dramatic and romantic game and an art form for good players to showcase their skills. One game even became known as the Immortal Game, where the player Anderson sacrificed all of his pieces to deliver a very dramatic checkmate. In the 20th century, chess became a truly international sport. During the Cold War, chess also became political between Russia and the US, which culminated in the very famous World Chess Championship in 1972 between Bobby Fischer and Boris Spassky. They sort of represented their respective countries in the match. Then, in 1997, the chess computer Deep Blue became so good that it beat a world champion for the first time. Okay, okay, this is all to say that chess has impacted us socially and politically for a really long time now. Wait, here comes Fisher, coming on the stage. The game was around in the Dark Ages, and it was around too when computers became smarter than people, so to speak. But in the Dark Ages, no one really knew how it affected us cognitively. So that's what I want to see. How is chess influencing us now? Okay, let's look at some studies. So, it's pretty well known that chess improves our visual, verbal, working memory. I know, that's a mouthful. But put simply, it's the kind of memory that helps us remember someone's phone number or email, for example. Or when you ask for directions, it helps us remember the right path to take. It makes sense that chess improves this, because it's a visual sport, and so obviously we train this ability while playing it. But how does chess affect our auditory verbal memory, which is just as important? That's the kind of memory that makes us receptive to verbally presented information, and it's what helps us process it and recall it for later use. It's even what makes us understand language and learn new stuff. Je m'appelle Claude. Je t'appelle Blue. <laughs> Let's just try it again. Well, in 2015, some researchers actually tested if chess helps with this kind of memory. They got 60 randomly selected people to undergo a test. Half of them were chess masters, and the other half never played chess. In the test, they gave each participant headphones and asked them to listen to 10 different words and to memorize them in order. 
while in one ear they played the words one at a time, they played the reverse sound of the word in the other ear to make it a dichotic test, and they even switched the right words from ear to ear to make it extra confusing. The participants were told to pay attention to the real words, but to disregard any nonsense words, and then afterwards asked to recall the words in the proper order. And since this is a chess video, it probably won't surprise you when I say the chess players did significantly better in the test. So, whereas non-chess players on average remembered just about 5 words from the list, the chess players actually remembered over 7 words on average. That's a pretty significant difference. And so, the researchers even suggested that chess should be considered as a tool to help improve cognitive function, especially for people with memory impairments or learning difficulties. Another study from 2014 actually took this one step further. They took 18 grandmaster and master chess players, which are just really good chess players, and then 20 novice players. And then they scanned all of their brains in a resting state through an fMRI. Here, you can see the data that they collected from the participants plotted on a brain image. So, all of the spheres here are different brain regions, all responsible for different cognitive functions. And these red lines here, well they pop up if the connection between these different regions is stronger for chess masters than novices. And it's pretty clear that most of the regions are connected by red lines. So for the result, basically the researchers found that master chess players have better functional connectivity between the regions that control learning and memory. So at this point it probably shouldn't be a surprise that chess helps us become smarter. But actually that deals with a common misconception surrounding the game. Because people often think that only smart people can play chess. But it's actually the opposite. Chess makes people smart. And it does so much more than that too. It's a game that brings us together across all these social divides. And it has so much value as a learning tool, even for life skills. Especially for kids, it helps us make calculated decisions and prepares us to live with the consequences of them. It helps us think ahead and to be patient. These are all really important things in life, and chess embodies them all. And that's why chess will always be relevant. So if you have a chess board lying around, or even a smartphone or a computer, you might want to consider asking someone to play a game with you. Alright, thanks for watching so far. If you got something out of this video, you can support my channel by liking, commenting and subscribing. I plan to keep making videos about interesting topics, so let me know if there's something in particular I should cover.